morning, everyone. This is Archbishop Richard Gagnon. I'm speaking to you from downtown Winnipeg at the Catholic Center. This is our Friday morning report for April the 12th. Thank you very much for joining us today. We're, we're midway through April. Time is marching on. Now, this past week, we had quite a phenomenon in the media uh, throughout the world. And of course, that was about the solar eclipse. And it dominated the news for days and days prior to the actual solar eclipse, which is a rare event, apparently. And if you lived in the eastern part of the country, you were able to see it more, more distinctly as the moon blocked out the, uh, the light of the sun, except for a, a bright corona around the perimeter. And um, I wonder what people were looking for. Why such a great deal of excitement about this? Uh, what did they hope to find? Uh, were some people looking for some sort of message in the heavens? Uh, this uh, phenomenon, which is a tremendous phenomenon. Uh, some people looked at it as a spiritual experience. And other people, of course, were observing this from a scientific point of view, trying to discover something about the sun's atmospheres and the planetary movements and so on. Um, I received an uh, email from a teacher in Alberta, uh, elementary school teacher, and she asked me this question, and I, I quote, she said, as Catholics, what should we teach our children about the eclipse tomorrow? Obviously, she was all excited and her class was all excited. And uh, she said, is there, a, is there a special biblical verse and prayer? And I thought, okay, that's a, that's a fair question for a teacher to ask. And I said, well, I was in a bit of a hurry. So I said very simply, well, go to the first chapter of Genesis and you'll find some important lessons there for the children especially when they're teaching, when you're teaching in Catholic school. And a few excerpts from the first chapter of Genesis read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was a formless wasteland, and darkness covered the abyss, while a mighty wind swept over the waters. Then God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate day from night. And so it happened. God made the two great lights, the greater one to govern the day and the lesser one to govern the night. And he made the stars. So I stress to the teacher that you can take that verse and you can teach the children some important uh, lessons. First one, God created everything. God is the creator with a capital C. God made everything out of nothing. And God continues to support creation. If God was to withdraw his hand, then creation would, I suppose, disappear because it came from God's creative power alone. And um, in talking to the children about this, uh, one cannot help but praise and, and give glory to God because God made all that we see and human beings are simply part of that creation. We didn't just get here the universe, the sun, the moon, and the stars didn't just be there. They were created, they were put there by the loving hand of the Creator Himself. And not only that, God made all the laws which govern the harmonious actions of the planetary bodies of all of creation. So God made the laws of nature also. And that is something to think about. And such a phenomenon as a solar eclipse is such a spectacular thing, so dramatic, it's an opportunity to speak to the children about God's creative hand. And that's one of the most fundamental things about God. God is creator and he made you and he made me. You know, it's a very interesting phenomenon when you look at some of those photographs of the earth from the spacecraft. And what you see is a beautiful blue orb in the blackened sky, so to speak, right? And that orb is blue, it has clouds, it is full of life, it has water. It's so different than other planetary bodies. And then what happens when a spacecraft craft lands on the Earth? What do you notice? All kinds of problems. There's wars, there's the, the way people treat one another, worries and frustrations and all these things. And you wonder, Whatever happened on the earth that the, the laws of Almighty God that govern the universe, what happened to these laws that govern relationships between people? What has gone wrong? And then one can go back to the first chapter 
of Genesis and read on to chapter 2 and chapter 3 and we learn some very important things. We learn that Adam and Eve, our first parents, fell from God's grace and sin came into creation and the relationship of love between people was damaged and the law governing relationships was wounded. And this too is a lesson for the children to reflect upon. God's laws not only govern the planets, God's laws also govern our relationships with other human beings. Human beings are not gods, we're only part of God's creation. And so in the story of Adam and Eve, they thought that they could determine what is right and what is wrong. They would have a knowledge of good and evil and they themselves would become like God. And we know how disastrous that was. And so a very important lesson here, God is God, we are created by God, God loves us greatly, but God's laws also govern the moral relationships between people. When we don't uh, obey that and look at that carefully, then we run into all kinds of problems. The church's role is to teach the revelation of Almighty God. The church's role is to pass on the tradition that we learn from our Judeo-Christian heritage, from the revelations to the Jewish people and then the revelation in its fullness in Jesus Christ. And not to become overwhelmed by the culture that surrounds us. So I thought it was very interesting, the same week that there was a solar eclipse, the Vatican came out with a very important document. It is called Dignitas Infinita. And it's all about how, how human beings relate to one another in terms of the moral law. It's all about human dignity. And it covers a whole series of different things, from war to poverty, from violence against migrants to violence against women, from abortion to surrogate motherhood to euthanasia, from gender theory to digital violence. There's some things in that document which many Catholics are not aware of, and I think what we'll do in our Friday report, very briefly here and there, uh, refer to some of those points in that document over the weeks to come, among other things that we mentioned in the Friday report. But today for that document, Dignitas Infinita, there's a couple of basic fundamental points that are made right at the very beginning of that document. The first one is, in light of Revelation, the church resolutely reiterates and confirms that the ontological dignity of the human person created in the image and likeness of God and redeemed in Jesus Christ. What that means is that human beings inherently, they have, just because they are human beings made in God's image, they have an infinite dignity. They have an infinite worth. My goodness, how important it is to stress that today and have that regard, because God looks at us that way. He looks at us exactly that way, having infinite worth, worthy of eternal life. A second point, this is an inalienable dignity corresponding to human nature apart from all cultural change. It is a gift and therefore present in an unborn child, an unconscious person, or an older person in distress. Regardless of what happens in society, whatever mistakes human beings make because of their fall from God, the inherent dignity of each human person remains the same. The culture may change, but it cannot dictate to the goodness that God has created in people made in his image. A third point. The church proclaims the equal dignity of all people, regardless of their living conditions or qualities, and she does so on the basis of biblical revelation. Women and men are created in the image of God. And this means a gift. Revelation is a gift. A revelation is revealed to us the true nature of the human person, regardless of where that person is from, what language they speak, what economic strata they come from, but regardless, we are all God's children. And indeed, we have the same equal human 
dignity, which is infinite. And lastly, Christ becoming incarnate, in other words, becoming man, confirmed the dignity of the body and the soul, and in his rising revealed to us that man's dignity rests on the fact that he is called to communion with God. And so, the human being has two components, a spiritual part and a physical part. The spiritual part is not superior to the physical part. The human being is composed of body and soul. And notice when Jesus rose from the dead, it was body and soul. And so as Christians, we treat the body with equal respect as the soul. We must treat the body and soul together as part of God's creation in the image of God. How important that is when we tend to separate the body from the soul. The body is something you throw away. We can do whatever we want in the body. The soul is the most important thing. No, the two are, are very closely linked together and we are made for communion with God. So I think we'll have a lot of interesting reflections on that important document. I think it really speaks to the culture today. So in conclusion, I mentioned last week that I visited a few communities. Uh, I was going into a few communities last weekend uh, to do confirmations. I did so in, in Duck Bay, a small Métis community. Uh, confirmed 12 children. There were four, 14 prepared, but 12 were, were there to be confirmed. Also confirmations in Swan River at St. Columba Parish. And then up north, even further, an hour and a half north of Swan River, to a small Métis community called Barrows, a beautiful little chapel, St. Helens, and uh, quite a few elders came for Mass. The last time I visited Barrows was before the pandemic. And so it was very beautiful. The receptions afterwards, the food that was brought, the, uh, the, the talking together, the socializing, very positive all the way through. And so the other day I met with our clergy that uh, ministered to indigenous communities and each one shared their Easter experiences, uh, Easter celebrations during Holy Week and on Easter weekend in the various indigenous communities. I was amazed at the number of baptisms that occurred, the different events that occurred, the people who came. It was very edifying. And so I think it's good for us to know that throughout the Archdiocese, we have many aspects to this diocese and uh, we have a common faith. And Easter time is a glorious time to give thanks to God for all of his many gifts. And I spoke very briefly about a beautiful devotion to the people because anybody can do this devotion and the devotion of divine mercy, right? Divine mercy, it's a beautiful devotion. It's about God's merciful love for all of us. And uh, when we think about that, it can be said on any rosary. It takes about five minutes. It teaches us about trusting in Jesus. Jesus, I trust in you is, is a sentence that, uh, that we find under the image of divine mercy. And we have confidence in God's love for us. And it teaches us to pray for other people, not just to be self-centered. So I think divine mercy, divine mercy Sunday, last Sunday, may be a bit of a motivation to us to look into a divine mercy, that devotion, and maybe start praying that devotion in our own life. Well, as you can see, there's many things to talk about in the Friday Report, and uh, we can make it as long as we want, but I think that's probably enough for today. Thank you very much for joining us. May God bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.